Welcome back to another round table. My name is Adam. With me once again, I have Rosman Hello, everyone. and Victor. Hi, everyone. And today, all the way from the United States, I have a very special guest with us. His name is Brandon Ahern. He is the Chief Investment Officer at CraneShare. So welcome, Brandon. Welcome. Welcome, Brandon. All right. So I'm going to tell a bit more about Brandon, and I'll give Brandon an opportunity to talk about yourself as well. And then after that, we're going to dive right into the topic as well. So Brandon is the Chief Investment Officer at CraneShares. He's been with CraneShares since 2012. And prior to that, Brandon was with Barclays Global Investors, which subsequently became uh, BlackRock iShares. All right. And uh, he's considered an expert in global financial markets and ETFs with a particular focus on China, which is what we're going to talk about today. All right. Uh, he produces a daily update called China Last Night, which also appears as a column on Forbes. And he also regularly appears on CNBC and Bloomberg. And he's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal and Investors Business Daily. Wow, that is quite a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> and now he appears at fifth person. Yeah, and now you're with <laughs> us. Most, most important. So joining most us. important. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So tell us a bit more about, I mean, what you do in Crane Shares. Well, Crane Shares endeavors to be a to earn the trust of investors through our balanced perspective on China's economy and capital markets. We offer a suite of thematic China ETFs, really the new China. Um, as well as we've taken what we've seen in China, where we think China's maybe ahead of other emerging markets or global and uh, created ETFs really based on that China thesis, but where we see China maybe ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, so we did, for instance, the first uh, global electric vehicle ETF. We've done the first uh, carbon credit allowance ETF. Um, so we've done we've done some some you know great you know really our, our core is is China uh, that you know really we really do believe that um, investors need a partner to help navigate what's taking place in China's economy and capital markets and we try to earn the the trust of investors through our research and uh, certainly we have a series of uh, China ETFs aligned with are in views of where investors should be allocating uh, capital in China in the years and decades to come. All right. So I think we've been covering China for some time, Rusman, Victor, myself. Yep. Um, and it's been a roller coaster in China, I think, since uh, I think July last year, where there's a China tech crash has been coming down. But then uh, recently, markets have jumped in China because the vice premier, Liu He, uh, said that they would roll out support for the Chinese economy as well, you know, to be cautious with measures for the capital markets there. So I think they've seen, we've seen a lot of intervention. Uh, and then now they say they're going to they're gonna relax things a bit. All right. So the moment that announcement came up, uh, I think the Chinese markets jumped 40%, which is tremendous. All right. Uh, and I think uh, KWeb as well, one of your ETFs jumped 40%. So I think a lot of our viewers who follow us, we, they know <laughs> about China. All right. They're interested in China. It's still the number two economy in the world. Big. A lot of people. Uh, and I think they want to know what is the, your view, you know, as an expert on China. What is, what is your view on all this uh, you know, government intervention in China? And more importantly, moving forward, what do you think, you know, is going to happen? Is, it, is, is all this really over and it's going to be like back to business as normal? Yeah, I think, you know, the last, uh, call it 13 months have been difficult for investors in China, but but I think it's always important first uh, to, to mention that, you know, how you define China has had a very, very significant impact on your results. So if your definition of China last year was the Shanghai or Shenzhen uh, composites, you 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 you, had, you did you did okay last year. You made you know nine or eleven percent, but if your definition was the Hang Sang, you were down thirteen percent. Um, if your definition was Chinese internet stocks, like you know we offer with our uh, K Web or uh, you know Crane Shares uh, China Internet ETF, you know, that was down almost fifty percent. So so I think I think the first thing you know that's important for investors is what what is your definition of China because. It, you could have had a decent year last year, or you could have had a really bad year. You know, you know, your China's bond market had a great, you know, the onshore treasury and policy banks had a great year last year. If, if you were long China's currency versus the dollar, you, you had a good year last year. So, so it's, 
what's really driving the disparity um, is, is always important is to recognize that the Shanghai and Shenzhen, the A share market is like 95% owned by investors in China. So it's really reflective of what, what do the Chinese think about China? And then we can contrast that with the Hong Kong and US listed shares, which are reflective more of what do foreign investors think about China? And I think I think that's where over the last year, what the Chinese think about Chinese investors think about China, what foreign foreign investors think about is, is very, very, you know, a huge disparity, right? And and I think you know, for foreign investors. They've they've almost been forced onto the sidelines because of the headlines that we we've gotten over the last 13 months, which is your know, first back in February of last year, we had Archegos, you know, this highly levered um, tech oriented hedge fund, you know, five of its 10 securities were US listed ADRs. And when it went out of business, those sold those holdings were sold at very deep discounts. And then and then, yes, you know, February through the end of the year, we had the implementation of China's internet regulation, which, which as foreigners, we view China as this singular entity. And it was like China's going after Alibaba or Tencent or JD, like every, every it was like for several months, every week, it was like another company. And, and, and what I think the many investors missed was that this regulatory implementation was driven by numerous regulators and those regulators were moving at very different speeds so at from the outside it looked like this ad hoc almost whack-a-mole approach of killing the tech darlings but but in reality it was more of you know the pboc was examining fintech um you know the uh, CAC, the cyberspace, you know, they were looking at user data, user protection, NDRC, MIIT are looking at things like anti-monopoly, anti-competitive. Uh, but that that forced a lot of investors, uh, professional investors to the sidelines, just not understanding what was happening and what what's the end game. Um, I think I think there are other factors. So we have also had the SEC articulating how they would implement the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, uh, which would delist the companies. And then we also had tax loss harvesting. So US investors can, if they create capital gains, they can offset those gains through losses. And last year, one of the only play, one of the only areas of the market that was down were these US ADRs. And so mm -hmm. in November and December, you had this selling pressure. And again, a lot of these sellers uh, were indiscriminate, right? They just wanted to get out of the names. And I think that put a lot of pressure on the securities over the course of last year. And then um, you had you know, I think things were in January, February were starting to come back. And then the Ukraine invasion, a lot of investors saw the, you know, the sanctions put on Russia and said, oh, my gosh, you know, could that happen to China? Um, and, if, and, and, and then there were investors that, you know, a lot of emerging market investors, you know, they, they had their money stuck in, it's stuck in Russia. <laughs> and so that's, it, it, they've been almost forced to sell down, you know, and that includes China. So, so then I think you, so you had this sum of all fears, right? You have all of these fears and it's put just tremendous pressure on the securities, really indiscriminate sellers, but also indiscriminate of the fundamentals. So, so, you know, when we got the vice premier speech, it, it, really addressed a number of these fears. It, it addressed the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. It addressed ending this internet regulation. And, and these are all things that, you know, said investors, oh my gosh, you know, all, all the reasons that we maybe came out of these names, you know, those are going away. And it led to this really dramatic rally. But at the same time, I think it's still early days uh, that I think I think the fundamentals of these companies, the share prices are really disconnected away from 
um, where they've been on a, a historical basis and, and certainly on a, on a relative basis as well. So, so I think if let's say if you are investors of uh, those uh, who hold uh, Chinese ADR, uh, do you think there is a possibility where you know they might or what should they do? You know, uh, do they convert or because there's still a risk that's hanging right right now, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's and you know we've gotten you know we've gotten a, a very strong sign that China wants to solve this issue. So, so that's a good thing. Um, you know, we've we've been very worried about this delisting risk. So we have mm. converted. Um, in, in the case of Alibaba, JD, Netties, uh, Billy Billy, we've, uh, JD, we've moved to Hong Kong just because of this risk. And we would anticipate continuing to move K-Web where a year ago, K-Web was, you know, probably 25% Hong Kong. And today it's more than 70%. So, so, um, so we've taken this very seriously. And I think investors... You know, you know, some element of this weakness we saw in the beginning of March was about, you know, the SEC starting this delisting process, but actually identifying the companies. And, yeah. and I think some element of investors were not, not naive, just, you know, you'd say it's just irrational. Why, why would anyone delist these <laughs> stocks? You know, oh, it yeah. just, you, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, this doesn't hurt China, you know, it's US global investors hold these stocks. So, so I think some of it is just uh, a lot of people just would say that's irrational, you know, you would never do that. But but, but it's important to realize the SEC didn't create this law, you know, US politicians did. And the SEC is simply the enforcement agency, you know, that's not, it's not their job to have an opinion or interpret it. Um, and I think, you know, part of the severe downdraft before the rebound was investors saying, oh, my gosh, this this could actually really happen. And uh, it's good. You know, we continue to see some signs that, you know, the China side, you know, looks very much it, it wants to solve this issue, which would be a very, a, a very good thing. Yep. So. So I, I think before the, uh, the rebound, I think the, the sentiment of from the Western side is quite negative on the Chinese stocks, right? So after the recent, you know, the premier came out and, and, and reassured, you know, the public and, and with the rebound, uh, what is the sentiment right now over at the Western side, you know? Well, I think, I think investors, you know, many investors get their news on China through the mainstream media, you know, the traditional media. And, and that, that narrative in many cases has been very negative. And I, I think, Victor, that's, that's one of the reasons why China should want to see these companies remain uh, listed in the United States, because they, they provide an insight into China's economy that you're not going to read in a news article. And, you know, when you read a quarterly report from these companies or their annual reports, you'd say, wow, you know, these companies are doing very innovative, dynamic things. And some of what we read, you know, about China in the news. So, you know, obviously kind of self-serving, you know, that's why we write the ChinaLastNight.com research blog is to try to provide that balanced perspective mm -hmm. for foreigners. Yeah. So, so I think I think ultimately, you know, China is is a very significant player in the global economy, in the U.S. economy as well, and and I think that's where the fear that somehow Russia-like sanctions could be applied to China, you know, you're applying sanctions to 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 Russia might cause a little bit of a global recession, but you know, apply sanctions like that to China, it's a global depression. And so I think I don't I don't I don't really see, you know, I think I don't I don't think there's any, you know, I think people recognize just how important, you know, China is to the global economy as well as how important it is to the U.S. economy. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, a lot of our viewers, I think they may be invested in Alibaba, Tencent, as we are <laughs> ourselves. And uh, I, from what I hear, I think a lot of the fear has already been we've gone through that right the last 13 months or so like you said all the negative news and everything and then with the vice premier coming out saying that things are going to cool off uh i think i take that as a positive sign right 
Um, but it's still early days, like you said. Um, but like you said, you mentioned just now that the fundamentals are still disconnected from where these stocks are right now. Yep. Right? Yep. I mean, there are still risks involved and all that, like you said, sanctions, but like, you know, sanctions on China are a different thing altogether. But fundamentals are still disconnected in a sense. Do you think, you know, these stocks will eventually come back? You know, you know it's going to be back to business, like I said. I, I, I do, I do. I, I think, Adam, you know, one, one thing that, um, you know, foreign investors sometimes don't recognize, and it goes back to this idea that China is this singular entity. And, you know, it's like China is a, geographically is, is a huge country, mm -hmm. huge population. Uh, but also, you know, China for 2000 years, you know, it, you know, has always had a big bureaucracy, right? To just to run, to govern, you know, at such a large geographic space without modern communication, it took this bureaucracy. And I think, I think what the, the vice premier's speech is, is telling these various regulators involved that the pendulum went too far. Yeah, too far. And, and so, you know, it will, you know, and, and, and maybe before it was too far the other way, right? Maybe mm -hmm. these companies were just allowed to grow in, in a way without any regulation. And so it went from one extreme to the other extreme. And now it's going to find this middle ground. And, you know, we're not, you know, for that, many of these regulators, they have to study, you know, what, what the vice premier said and understand, you know, okay, how, how are we going to change what we've been doing for the last year? And so after the speech, it was interesting that the PBOC, the CSRC, the Ministry of Commerce all came out and kind of reiterated the speech. And I think what we'll see over the next several weeks or maybe several months are some of the other regulators that have been involved in this to come out. And, and I think those will be signs for many investors, you know, they'll want to see these tangible results. But but remember, markets are always forward looking. Yep, you yeah. know, markets are always anticipating. And so I think I think, you know, we'll, we're more apt to see the stocks start to come back, just because some element of investors are going to say, hey, you know, I understand China. I know what the vice what, what the vice premier said is going to happen. So I do think, you know, we've seen, you know, if you look at the forward looking PE of, you know, 10 cent, it's, 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 you know, 32% below um, um, the five year average, which is two standard deviations below the five year average. The, the same is true for Alibaba. You know, the forward looking P is 13 right now. The five year average is 24. So that's a 45 percent. That's that's 2.3 standard deviations. And so when we look at a lot, you know, when we look at the, a lot of these companies, you know, they're very inexpensive. I mean, it's just it's very inexpensive. And I think um, you know, we actually had a company within KWeb go to a negative enterprise value. Uh, wow. and that's wow. that's something you just don't see. So so what what's what's happening? I think and what you're seeing is that as the companies report their calendar year Q4 earnings, they're starting to buy stock. And 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 for you know students of China's capital markets, you'd say okay, that's the company. You know not only saying that they think the stock is cheap. But they're also putting their cash to work, which means that they're less worried about a, the, the effect of a regulatory clampdown. That if, if you think the government was trying to put you out of business or might fine you, you would, you would hoard cash, right? You wouldn't yep. spend it. So, so the companies are telegraphing something to investors, you know, 10 cent made a big, big purchase right after its. Yeah. Um, right after its earnings and i think you'll see obviously alibaba you know increase their uh, you know from 15 billion to 25 so so you know this is this is something where the companies are telling us as investors and so yes we had this incredible dramatic move from a severe capitulation but i'm, I'm more constructive i'm more optimistic 
because I think there's a lot of investors um, are still sitting on the sidelines. And so, you know, as, as you know, we get some positive momentum, it's going to pull this money off of the sidelines. Okay. I, I see your K-Web uh, holdings. Uh, I know you got your Tencent as some of the largest, uh, you know, portfolio location and followed by Baidu, Meituan, Alibaba. So among these uh, companies, which one do you think that it's going to recover the most or uh, the fastest you know once this <laughs> overhang is over <laughs> i think that's what the, our audiences want to know <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. well well i always say you know um yeah we would we would charge two and 20. we would charge hedge fund fees if we uh <laughs> no it's uh, um you know you know uh, we love them all you know we you know we we are big believers in the companies in the opportunity so we like the basket approach I think, you know, a lot of these names are just dr- down so dramatically. And, uh, you know, I think, I think investors are showing a preference for companies that are relisted in Hong Kong. So that's, that's kind of your safety mechanism in case a, the holding foreign companies accountable mm-hmm. is, you know, does come to fruition. So, so the, the names that are dual listed in Hong Kong have actually done a little bit better or, mm-hmm. or primary right. listed in Hong Kong, like a Tencent. And, um, so I, you know, I like them all, you know, I think, I think they all have interesting opportunities and, um, you yeah, know, there's, they all have a, you know, very interesting stories where, you know, you would argue Alibaba, you know, arguably the leader. You know, has come down from you know three hundred to a hundred, um, and they're buying back. You know, it's the the additional ten billion of buyback would represent you know a, over three percent of shares outstanding. Um, at the same time, ten cent is doing a lot of shareholder friendly things, like they just spun out uh, Jade their JD position to investors. They, yeah, you know, they they cut their um, exposure to the Singapore C-Lim. yeah, the C. Yeah. Yep. And then they've uh, started buying back stock. You know, I think they, you know, um, you know, the buyback, you know, uh, was after the day after their earnings. So I think, you know, back in August, they started buying names and they bought stock every day for, I think it was almost five weeks. So JD, you know, because of the spinoff, from Tencent, it's it's kind of weighed because mm. what what happens, you know, what does Prosys or Naspers do? You know, do they hold the JD stock or do they sell it? So so JD's been kind of weighed down because what what are what are investors going to do? Um, um, but certainly JD's very well positioned, and then I think so so you know certainly. Um, you know, there's, you know, we could kind of go through all of the names and, and there's a great, great rationale. There's a great fundamental reason to own them. Um, and that that's where we, we like the idea of, you know, it's you know, self-serving and highly biased of you know, buying <laughs> right. the you know, yep. basket approach. Yeah. So do, do you see, you know, a, any you know, near or midterm risk? You know, yeah, investing in China. Yeah, I think fundamentally, yeah. we know China is cheap. Yeah, and they have some of the biggest, best companies in that, in the country, yeah. right? But I think it's important to balance um, all these things as well. And what are the risks that investors yeah. need to watch out for if they're going to look in China? Yeah, yeah, you know, and and I, and I think you know, you know, one of I, you know, I've been, I personally have been buying K Web for. <laughs> Okay. Um, almost the whole way down. Um, and yeah. Um, so, you know, you know, certainly I was very early and and that's because I did focus on the fundamentals yep. that, you know, the, the Q1 earnings last year were, were, were good. Yeah, Q2, yeah. Q3. I mean, I mean, so, so I think this is where, you know, we have to remember that, you know, the animal spirits of, of the market, you know, we can, you know, the market sometimes as efficient as it is, you know, this is a scenario where people were selling not because of the fundamentals, because they just, ha- you know, they're delisting risk, you know, US-China political, you know, rhetoric or, 
um, you know, the internet regulator, you know, people sold. And so certainly I think, you know, going forward the risk, you know, you've got, um, you know, a very clear, you know, significant outbreak of COVID in China right now. And, you know, we're, you know, you know, various cities are in various states of quarantine or lockdown and, you know, what effect will that have? Um, and in some ways, you know, the K-Web companies are kind of like the work from home stocks. Um, yeah. yep. Not that we want to, you know, you know, benef- say that we're beneficiaries to a terrible situation. But, uh, you know, clearly, you know, these lockdowns and quarantines will have an effect on China's GDP. And um, if it's sustained, you know, they've said that they're going to, you know, try to, not go to the extreme like we saw in the first quarter of 2020. Uh, so I, I do think that that is a risk. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, you know, real estate um, is always, it's been a risk that's very well publicized um, that, you know, you have some over levered real estate developers like the Evergrands and, and some other small, you know, some other players, but, but not not all Chinese developers are in that situation. So I think I think a lot of times the risks, you know, you read about them. You know, the the Western media highlights them uh, significantly. Yeah. You know, certainly, um, you know, many countries I think you know recognize you know the terrible situation in Ukraine. Um, but because they, you know, you know, many countries like China, you know, they have economic ties to the Ukraine. Uh, but they also have economic ties to to Russia. And so I think a lot of, you know, commodity import countries like China, India, um, you know, a whole host of companies are, you know, they, they're, they're in, in a you know, difficult situation. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of, you know, something, a risk that, you know, you're not going to read about. I mean, I think, I think, I think, you know, this year, you know, this fall is a very important year for China politically with the you know, National maybe, People's Fund. Maybe the risk, uh, maybe hopefully Xi Jinping doesn't be, end up become Putin. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so I, I mean, think, I, yeah, okay. No, no, I, I think, um, you know, it's more of, you know, the, they're very different, but, you know, the media kind of uses them interchangeably. And that that that's a risk because, you know, U.S. Com- U.S. publicly traded companies generate almost four hundred billion dollars of revenue in China, mm. right? So so, you know, China and Russia are very very different in terms of the economies and scale and the globalization of of the economies, but it, it is worrisome to see how the two are sometimes used interchangeably, you know, even though they're very different. All right. I think that's a bit of, that's quite a lot of information about uh, China. I think, thank thank you so much, Brandon. I mean, I think we learned a lot ourselves as well. I mean, we've been following China for a few years as well, but it's always good to have a perspective from someone um, from the West as well. Mm. And and you've been in China so many times yourself. So you're familiar with the country yourself. Yep. Well, ultimately, that's what, you know, I think that's something we need more of, right? We need, yeah. we need yep. people, um, you know, that's where hopefully, the, you know, through vaccinations and such, you know, you know, people can go and see China, right? That seeing is believing and certainly. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think that's the best way to learn about another culture or country as well yep. yeah all right so i want to thank you so much for being on this round table brandon this is extremely special for have some, someone all the way from the u.s join us as well if not it's just the three of us <laughs> yeah. ugly mugs all the time <laughs> yeah. all right so once again i want to thank uh thank you brandon so much for joining us and yeah. that's rusman with me yeah. that is victor yeah. my name thank is Adam. You. thank you so much for joining us i hope you really like this uh special edition of this round table because brandon's right here with us yeah. and of course any questions feel free to put them in the comment section you know subscribe to our channel many more roundtables coming up again of course please hit the like button and tell us we're doing a great job as well all right so thank you so much and we'll see you around once again